Well, hello and welcome to Claremont Parish Church for our service that's for Sunday the 29th of November. My name's Gordon Palmer, a minister here, and as well as myself uh, taking part in the service, there will also be George Sneddon, who's here on his student placement. The 29th of November this year is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent's a word from the Latin, which means coming, and during the season of Advent, we think of the coming and prepare for the coming of Jesus born as a child in Bethlehem. But also we think and reflect too on how Jesus promised that he will come again, not as a babe in Bethlehem, but in glory at the end of time to bring in the new heavens and the new earth. So we observe this season of Advent and we've usually had in here again our Advent ring. The fact that it is round is a symbol of the eternity of God's love. There is no beginning and no end to it. The fact that it's evergreen leaves is a symbol of the always the new life that is on offer in Christ. And then the light of symboli, the candle symbolizing Jesus, the light of the world. And each of the candles um, has a, a theme as, as well attached to it. And the first candle which I'm about to light is the theme of hope. The people of Israel in the Old Testament had heard God promises through the prophets. The prophet Isaiah spoke words of hope to Israel. He said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. So hope is like a light shining in a dark place. Hope is something that God brings to us and gives to us to guide us, to help us move forward. And we think of that theme of longing for God's coming and the fulfillment of that and the hope that that gives in our first hymn this morning, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
join together in prayer, and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his followers, the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use. Words for that will be on the screen. Let us pray. Well, that verse we read a few minutes ago from Isaiah, just one of many words in Scripture which point to the gift of a Messiah, which point to the gift of hope that we have in and through Christ Jesus. We thank you that you're a God who has spoken, and a God who has spoken words of hope, a God who has revealed yourself and revealed something of your plans and purposes and calling for us. Lord, the Christmas story, which we remember at this time of year, wasn't the beginning of that message of hope because the Old Testament has many glimpses of your plan to redeem your people and to bring them into fellowship with you. The Old Testament gives many glimpses through the prophets in the work of the priests and indeed in the rule of the kings of how Jesus was to come and be prophet, priest, and king supreme. In Jesus, we see then your purposes taking further shape and again, they bring hope. Promises are kept. Prophecies fulfilled. And so we see that you're a God who keeps your word, a God whose uh, purposes are not frustrated, a God who doesn't um, run out of power, but a God who's moving forward. And we look forward from that time of Jesus' birth his death, his resurrection, the gift of the Spirit, and then there's the promise of Christ coming again in the new heaven and the new earth. And so Advent calls us also to, to look forward, to anticipate. But gracious God, that's not always how we are and how we've been. So often we've preferred to keep you at a distance, not wanting you to interrupt our life, not wanting that you to challenge or to question our priorities. Too often we've not hungered for your bread of new life or thirsted for waters of your Holy Spirit. And all too often we've had few longings for the coming kingdom of God. And that's true not just for ourselves as individuals, but that's been all too true for us as church. We have led our capacity for expectation, our sense of eager longing, wilt and fade. Too readily we've made peace with things as they are. Too readily we have dealt with other powers and kingdoms and sought a way of glory that has nothing to do with the cross. Forgive us, when we've just gone along with the world's powers and the world's criteria. Forgive us for the times when our horizons have just been filled by what the material things that the world provides. Forgive us for the times for when we have settled for far less than you want to give us. And Lord, forgive us and assure us of pardon and set us free from indifference, set us free from being too taken up with ourselves. Give us a godly hope, not something vague that things will turn out all right, but an energizing, active, determined focus on seeing your kingdom come. And so, Lord, in this Advent season, as we wait to celebrate and welcome that first Christmas gift when you gave us the gift of hope wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Might we wait with hope, with growing expectation that the plans and purposes and ways of God will overcome. In Jesus' name. And in his words, we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven,
We have two Bible readings, both from the New Testament. The first comes from Philippians chapter 2, and the the first um, 11 verses of that chapter are kind of our theme passage for this series. Um, But today I'm just going to read verses uh, 5 to 8. So Philippians 2, reading verses 5 to 8. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We'll be focusing in on that eighth verse of Jesus being found in appearance as a man and humbling himself and being obedient to death and death on the cross. And with that in mind, our second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 of Hebrews, and I'm going to be reading verses 10 to 18. So verses 10 to 18 of Hebrews chapter 2. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. And since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted." Amen. May God bless his word to us. Well, as we've been saying, the 29th of November 2020 is the first Sunday in Advent, the season of focus and waiting upon the coming of Jesus, both as a babe at Bethlehem and also looking forward to his return in glory at the end of time when all will be judged and when God will bring into being his new creation. At this time of year, we might see some nativity scenes coming. I'm going to get one here that I can put together. (coughs) Of course, it needs Jesus. Jesus is an essential part, is he not? And Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, they're here. And since since it's uh, stable or whatever, there's a few animals as well. We've got some cows, maybe sheep over there, yes, oh, there's some kings going to come, and well, you get, the, you, you know who's there, you get the picture, what's happening. But I've been looking for, um, I've been looking for the Grim Reaper, and he doesn't seem to be there. This, this nativity t- scene doesn't seem to have a Grim Reaper. Come come to think of it, not many of them do. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a nativity scene with the Grim Reaper there. But he could be there. In fact, maybe he, he should be there. Because death is not absent at Christmas. It's not absent on the night of Jesus' birth, and not only that, but shortly afterwards, the wise travelers who had had made Herod aware that the Messiah had come, 
And all too soon, Herod had every baby boy or infant boy in Bethlehem massacred. Death featured not only in the circumstances around Jesus' birth, but also in the very nature and purpose of it. Jesus was born to die. Well, I don't mean Jesus was born one of us. He was. Therefore, he's going to die just as surely as you and I are are going to die unless Christ comes first. No, Jesus was born with the purpose of going to die. His entry into this world was in order to enter into a battle on our behalf, to take on and deal with our enemy. And so, verses 14 and 15 of that passage in Hebrews, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He shared our humanity, notice verse 14, so that, here's the reason why he shares our humanity, so that by his death he might defeat the devil. And so from the outset, the grim reaper could be here, could be in the scene, the Grim Reaper could be standing there saying, Jesus, your days are numbered. Now, when the verse 8 in Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus was found in appearance as a man, he's not saying less than the writer to the Hebrews is saying when he said, verse 14, Jesus shared in our humanity. Philippians 2 doesn't mean Jesus just looked like what he was one of us, but no, if you looked, that's who he was. If you look properly at him, you would see his humanity. A couple of years ago, we were um, getting the man's kitchen repainted. And um, there was one bit of the man's kitchen that uh, Karen refused to let them repaint. There was a bit of a wall um, where we had, as the Ruth and Sally were growing up, measured what height they had reached at different times. And so there's this wall in the kitchen with with marks going up the wall, and then it would say Sally or Ruth beside the mark, and then give the date. And so we could see how they had grown bit by bit. They didn't just become the size that they are now overnight. Mary and Joseph could have done that in Jesus' home. Maybe they did do that in Jesus' home. Maybe they could have got Jesus, aged five, Jesus, aged seven, Jesus, aged nine, because Jesus grew bit by bit, just like the rest of us. He didn't enter into the the world ready for public ministry, but he became human. He shared our humanity. Humbly, he grew Humbly he waited for that growth and that development, verse 8 in Philippians 2. The writer to the Hebrews talks, verse 10, about Jesus being made perfect through his suffering. Now, that doesn't mean there were imperfections that they had to get rid of. Let's, let's purify him a wee bit more. Let's burn off some rubbish that doesn't need to be there. No, it means that Jesus was being made ready for suitable for, qualified to be our Savior by sharing our humanity. And that included some suffering, for that is the lot of humans. So Jesus, like his environment, like ours, was cursed. The ground grew thorns and grew weeds. Jesus could only eat bread after he'd worked hard for it. He knew poverty. He knew what it was like to be a refugee. He tasted bereavement, pangs of hunger and thirst, physical exhaustion, the malice of enemies, the faithfulness of friends, public rejection and humiliation, fear, and even on a cross, he experienced God-forsakenness. And so Jesus' humanness is not something that is worn a bit like a mask or a piece of clothing or an artificial limb, something that he can take off when it suits. His humanity was very real. It was who he is. And it was through his humanity he experienced life and expressed himself. He became like us in every way, verse 17 of Hebrews 2. 
He was a fetus, became a baby, an infant, an adolescent, an adult. His body had the same chemistry, the same anatomy, the same physiology. It was a genuine entering into the possibility of all those experiences which we in our bodies are exposed to. He had ordinary human affections. He showed tender consideration for his mother, compassion for others. He longed for company. He experienced emotions that we feel, joy, anger, amazement, grief. He had to make choices. He had to humble himself further and not turn stones into bread. He had to discipline himself not to run away in Gethsemane. And these were not effortless, unconditioned decisions of an untouched deity. They were the painful decisions of a human being made on the basis of limited information by one who was conscious of frailty and fearful of the cost. And then, and then more than that, verse 18 of Hebrews 2, Jesus was tempted. His being without sin didn't protect him from temptation and pain. In fact, it made him feel these all the more. The devil came to him when he was hungry and alone. Come on, have a picnic. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to notice. You can even put some tomato sauce on it, eh? He tried to trip Jesus up through enemies, through friends. And we mustn't think, oh, it would be dead easy for Jesus to resist temptation. He's, he's God after all. No, yes, he's God, but he's human. And in fact, it's, it's, it's as we resist temptation, we feel its force all the more. You know, I might... <clears throat> try and persuade someone to do something they don't want to do for me. I say, well, I'll give you a hundred quid if you do it. No, they're tempted. But they say, no, I'm not going to do that. I think about it a bit more and I say, okay, I'll give you 200 quid. No, I'm getting desperate now. Okay, I'll give you 500 quid. Now, that's a lot more tempting than just the 100 that I started with. And it's because the other person said no to 100, because he said no to 200, that I'm tempting him all the more. You see, that's the way temptation works. That when you say no, it doesn't mean temptation necessarily goes away. It doesn't mean temptation gets less. In fact, very often it means temptation increases. And Jesus then was feeling the, fo the full force of temptation, a fuller force of temptation than you or I have ever felt because there have been points where we have given in. And ultimately, he humbled himself, it says in verse 8 of Philippians 2, by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He allowed false charges to be made against him. He allowed betrayal by one of his friends. He allowed for lies to be told at his trial. He allowed himself to be nailed between two criminals. He allowed the crowd to walk by and join in the taunting and the mickey-taking. And as it says in 1 Peter 2, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Okay, so the passage in Hebrews chapter 2 that I read fills out more of that verse in Philippians, uh, verse 8 of Philippians 2. But notice that verse 8 in Philippians 2, and notice how it's got four stages or four steps. He was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And we might, in reading it, think after the third one, well, that's about as far as it can go. He's, he's obedient to death, but worse was to come. It was a tortuous death, death on the cross, but also it was the penalty of sin, the act that separated Jesus from, from the Father. Now, Advent is about waiting. Advent is not the end in itself. Christmas comes. But then Christmas is not the end, for not only was Jesus born, he lived 
And the cross where he died was not the end. Three days later, Jesus was risen. And the resurrection was not the end. There was the ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit and God's people. And even then, the story is not complete, for Christ will come again. He will come in very different circumstances, but with the same love and the same determination, defeat all of his and all of our enemies. So the grim, grim reaper might well be here in the nativity scene. As he should be there as a reminder to us as why Jesus came, why he was born, the so that of Hebrews 2. The first of the four steps in Philippians 2, 8, being found in appearance as a man, so that he could humble himself, so that he could become obedient to death, so that it could even be death on a cross. And the way he does this, this step-by-step -step lowering, this step-by-step -step stooping, one of the things that says to us is that, that you know, there is nothing that we can do that puts us beyond the reach of God. That's good news. There's nothing that you can do or I can do that's going to make God say, oh, that's disgusting, I'm not going to sort that out. There's nothing that you can do or I can do that God says, oh, I'm shocked, I want nothing more to do with them. Step by step, stage by stage, Willingly, deliberately, he stoops, he lowers himself, even obedient to death on a cross. There is no price that he will not pay for our salvation. There is no obstacle that he's not going to overcome. There is no guilt that he will not take from us. There is no end to his reserves of patience with us. And all of that should give us every confidence we need, every entitlement to say that if we trust, He will not fail us. If we come to Him, He will not turn us away. If we confess, He will forgive. There's a ground for hope. This is not wish fulfillment. Christian hope is not, oh, I would like it to turn out okay. That's what the world does with no reason for it. Even in the newspaper this very morning and the day I'm speaking, Pele talking about how he can hope he's going to play football with Maradona in the sky. Pure dreams. No reason for it. No basis for it. Mere wish fulfillment, that is not Christian hope. Christian hope says, because of a Savior who stooped and stooped and stooped and stepped and stepped and went lower and lower, he is able to reach me and to pick me up. Is that the God that you're waiting for this Advent? Is that the God that you're willing to welcome? There is no other God. There is no other Savior. Take time to reflect. He did this for the likes of us. Let us pray. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love that you should be willing to be found in appearance as a man. Amazing love that you should humble yourself. You should let yourself grow bit by bit, stage by stage, day by day, and take in that all the hurts and sorenesses as well as the joys and delights of life. Amazing love that you should become obedient by willing to die for us. Amazing love that you should be prepared for that death, even to be the torturous, agonizing death on a cross and a death that is bearing the sins of the world. Lord, give us a better sense of your love. 
and in knowing that we're loved like that, might we hope, not in presumptuousness, but truly hope, not because we're wonderful, not because we want things to turn out in a particular way, but hope because you love like that. Amen. I'm going to have the hymn that we were um, in, in Clermont learning um, just in the run-up to Easter. Um, See Jesus stripped of majesty. And after we've sung that hymn, which focuses on that immensity of God's love for us and His sacrifice for us, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And after the Creed, George is going to be leading us in prayer. I believe in God. Let's now come together in our prayer for others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter this time of Advent, help us find time in our busy lives to commune with you. Moments to reflect on the wonder of your love 
so that we can prepare our minds and our hearts for receiving you afresh. As our faces differ, so do each of our needs, but we come acknowledging that you are prepared to meet everyone. In this time of preparation, we pray you open our hearts to the families and friends who are not in our immediate vicinity, who because of distance or because of isolation are not able to be with us. And we pray for our brothers and sisters across the church who celebrate this time of waiting in different ways, perhaps in solitude, perhaps in secret. Grant all of your people the opportunity to renew our relationship with you, to prepare a place for you. And for us here at Claremont, we pray that you will give us the grace to live life as faithful members of your family, declaring your name and singing your praises in all that we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you spoke to us today through the preaching of your word and reminded us that you are humbling yourself by becoming one of us. And we know you did that because of your love, your true love for the whole world. You came as the Prince of Peace and brought a message of peace for all the people. And so we pray for peace in our world. We're victims of war and refugees and women, widows, orphans are lifted out of misery and are able to live a life they deserve. We ask that your spirit falls on governments, that they may act with compassion, resist the temptation for conflict and seek consolation in all circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, alongside this season of Advent, we are aware of the cold nights and the dropping temperatures. And so we want to bring before you those who've got no shelter, those who don't have anywhere to sleep. We pray too for those who dread the darker nights, those who've lost family those who are lonely and those who are separated, let your presence be with them. And in this time of waiting, may we be able to open a door for those who need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray too for those who are ill, those whose life seems to be one long period of waiting, and those who live each year with uncertainty. We bring to mind those who don't know how a result will pan out. We bring them to you in the confidence that you love them and know their every need. Assured by your own experience of pain, temptation, loss and loneliness. In your mercy, Lord hear our prayer and accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus, who humbled himself to walk with us, to bear our pain and to lift us up. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And just before we sing our closing praise, um, <clears throat> Murray Pollock, formerly of Loch Long, but uh, more recently been living in Kelvin Drive and is his wife Anne, one of our elders, is in the care home at White Hills. Murray, Murray Pollock died last weekend. His funeral was to be on the 8th of December. Uh, we will uh, make known the information about the um, video link for those who want to join the service online. But do commend uh, Murray's uh, family to your prayers. Anne herself has got dementia. She's um, not going to be well enough to um, attend the funeral. And I know that that's um, a hardship that she's not aware of, but that their doctors are feeling. So do remember them in your prayers. Um, there was a, Chris, a, 
uh, Clement calling out on uh, Friday with information about some of the things over Christmas, and we want to encourage folks to, to help us in our, our Christmas uh, work and mission. The Advent drop-in would have been um, yesterday, but we've provided materials and sent, sent them out if, for an Advent drop-in that you can do at home, uh, a reflection on four themes of Advent, four themes that are tied up also with uh, the COVID pandemic. I commend that to you, and if you haven't got that leaflet and want a copy of it, then please get in touch with the church office and we can, we can supply that. Also, we're repeating our... Um, challenge and encouragement to read through Luke's gospel during the days of December leading up to Christmas, 24 chapters, one a day between the 1st and the 24th of December, so that when we reach Christmas, we've got that fresh grasp on who the wonderful Savior is, that whose, whose birth we celebrate. Um, you can either read the chapters at home, or we have been also preparing material online that you can, you can use with um, someone from Claremont doing the, doing the reading. So that's from Tuesday, the 1st of December, through to the 24th. We've also um, still looking for uh, information about who some of our Christmas bags can be delivered to. We've um, said that we're wanting to bless folks with, with a gift this, this Christmas. It's got some goodies in it. It's got a, a new CD that the Praise Band have been recording. And we're wanting folks to be able to take them to, to a neighbor, maybe somebody who's elderly on their own, and, and, offer, and offer them this gift with the, the blessing of Claremont. So we really need your support to um, make known who these gifts should be taken to. It's a great chance for you to extend a hand of friendship and, and a blessing to um, friends and, and neighbors. So again, if you've got someone or two or three people in mind that you could um, bless with one of these bags, Again, do contact the church office and do let us know because we want them to be not sitting in a cupboard come March or April, but we want them to go out in December and be um, an encouragement and a blessing to others. It's a way of serving, and service is what Jesus was about and what he calls us to do and to be. From heaven you came, helpless babe, is our closing praise, and after that, the words of the grace. Mm -hmm. 